Hello, I'm Johan Schalko, and I'm with the Southwest Initiative for the Study of Middle East Conflicts. And welcome to SISMEC Presents, our series of interviews on the most current Middle East conflicts through the eyes of scholars and practitioners. Today, we're with Dr. Stephen Zunis. Dr. Zunis uh, chairs the Middle Eastern Studies Program at the University of San Francisco, where he's professor of politics and international studies. Uh, he's author of the books Western Sahara, War, Nationalism, and Conflict Irresolution, and Tinderbox, U.S. Middle East Policy and the Roots of Terrorism. Now, he has also edited the book, Nonviolent Social Movements, A Geographical Perspective. Dr. Zunis, thank you very much for being with us. Pleasure to be here. And welcome to Tucson. Oh, great. Uh, Dr. Zunis, um, most of our viewers are familiar with the most famous nonviolent social movements. Um, mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi in India struggling against the uh, colonial regimes, um, the civil rights movement, in the United States under Dr. Martin Luther King, the Vietnam anti-war movements. Um, but are nonviolent social movements um, different from simple civil disobedience? Mm -hmm. Well, nonviolent social movements can come as a much broader uh, array of strategies and tactics and goals than what we usually think of as a civil disobedience, particularly in liberal, demo liberal uh, democratic societies. Uh, we have seen, a, though, um, Nonviolent action has been around for millennia. Uh, we've seen a remarkable upsurge in recent years. I mean, the past um, you know, uh, 30 or, or so years, uh, there have been scores of authoritarian regimes ousted uh, through strategic nonviolent action from the Philippines to Serbia, from Chile to Poland, uh, and uh, now we're seeing this uh, unfold in the in the Middle East. Uh, the Freedom House uh, did a recent uh, study that showed uh, about 70 countries that had made the transition from authoritarianism to varying degrees of democracy uh, over the, this, these past three decades. And they found that um, while there are some cases where elites voluntarily um, ceded control to democratic majorities, there were a number of cases of, of armed revolutions and one or two of foreign intervention. Uh, the vast majority, uh, you know, uh, nearly three quarters of the cases of, uh, of democratic transitions were a direct result of, of democratic civil society organizations engaging in strategic nonviolent action. Uh, it, some, some were dramatic, uh, like uh, in Manila and Belgrade and right. more recently in Cairo. Some were more gradual, but uh, this was the, 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 the most important variable in pushing uh, uh, governments to a more democratic direction. Well, this is, uh, I think, a very important point because I think that there is a stereotype that might exist out there that perhaps strategic nonviolence uh, wouldn't have much appeal to the, the people of the Middle East and wouldn't have much chance of success in a place as, as, as violent as the Middle yeah. East. Mm -hmm. So could you give us some of the examples of strategic nonviolence that have uh, taken place and succeeded in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. Well, there, we've uh, <clears throat> well, obviously more very recent uh, episodes in, in Tunisia and e Egypt, but even even prior to that, um, uh, there was a Cedar Revolution in, in Lebanon, uh, which forced the um, um, Assyrians uh, out of the country. Uh, the Nomeri regime uh, in in uh, Sudan right. was ousted in 1985 in a nonviolent civil insurrection, though. Uh, and, and it led to four years of Sudan being the most democratic uh, country in the region. That was tragically cut short, of course, in the military coup in 1989. Right. Um, uh, a, er, back in '64, another military regime was ousted <laughs> in Sudan using similar tactics, okay. though um, um, that democratic period was unfortunately fairly uh, uh, brief as well. The Tuar regime in Mali, um, in the Maghreb, uh, was uh, um, overthrown in 1991 in an, uh, unarmed insurrections. An, an insurrection. Iran has quite a history. They overthrow right. the Shah, uh, uh, of course, but you can go back to the Constitutional Revolution in 1906, the tobacco strike, and other protests against related concessions in the 1890s. Uh, and so, you know, there's there's quite a, and the Egyptian uh, uprising against the British in 1919, which uh, led the led to the end of um, a formal British colonial control. So there's actually quite quite a history. And if you go beyond uh, the Middle East to other parts of the Islamic world. Um, you know, you um, uh, Irshad in Bangladesh mm -hmm. in in, uh, in 1990, Saharto in Indonesia right. uh, uh, 98. in 98, um, uh, Gayoom in the Maldives just uh, just a couple years ago. Uh, you know, so there's um, 
there's quite a history of this, uh, and I, I think in many ways, uh, uh, um, this, despite the stereotype in the West that oh, since uh, you know uh, uh, Muslim societies are more into the collective than the individual, mm -hmm. uh, that therefore they are more tolerant of authoritarian regimes. There's also this implied social contract in Islam mm -hmm. that goes back to the early caliphs and the right. hadith, which uh, which uh, really. Uh, where there's an, uh, essentially a social contract between yes, the ruler between and the state and exactly the if they're if they if they're yeah yes you obey the ruler if the ruler is just if the ruler follows w w uh, the will of God right. but if the ruler is unjust uh, then the then people the, have the right to unseat yeah and if not the right even the obligation right. to uh, to to resist well we'll come back to the uh, the most current examples of Tunisia and Egypt but um, I'd like to discuss uh, just for a moment the 1987 uh, Intifada mm -hmm. um, in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, obviously, that really uh, caught the attention of the world because it seemed to bubble up from mm -hmm. below rather than being organized from above. And there was this David versus Goliath mm -hmm. um, aspect to it. But, you know, some of the most iconic images uh, were you know, young men, the Shabab, mm -hmm. you know, throwing rocks yeah, right. yeah. and, uh, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails. Now, obviously, you can't compare rocks to bullets. Mm -hmm. But does the, does the act of throwing a stone or the thought that goes behind it, um, you know, or, or even, sha you know, smashing um, the shop front window, mm -hmm. Does this does this automatically violate the the strategy and the concept of a of a nonviolent social movement or strategic mm -hmm. nonviolence? Yeah. Uh, it it varies. I mean, I think certainly uh, you know those that are motivated to nonviolent action from a pacifist ethic would 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 mm -hmm. uh, would, would say this is uh, indeed you know violates that uh, that that ethos. But um, it's important to remember that the vast majority of nonviolent movements. Uh, we're not led by pacifists. Um, you know, Gandhi and King are the uh, major exceptions in that regard. Um, most people uh, engage in nonviolent struggle because they find that strategically it works better. The um, general, and generally in in, in uh, uh, Western industrialized you know countries, uh, you know um, e even scared acts of, vi uh, of vandalism or throwing rocks at police uh, tends to hurt a movement. Um, I mean, look at the example of uh, Seattle in 1999, right. where uh, Classic. No, 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 you know, there were uh, you know, 50,000 people in a legal peaceful protest, another 10,000 in a uh, nonviolent blockade, mm -hmm. maybe 100 self style anarchists right. uh, breaking windows in Starbucks. Guess who got all the publicity? Right. <laughs> but uh, the um, uh, generally, the, I think the the, the, the key is is. Um, what can you do to mobilize more people on your side? What can you do to get the um, uh, support internationally? Uh, what can you do to weaken the uh, um, the legitimacy, uh, the, the, the legitimacy of the regime, or in this case, the occupation? Uh, you know, weaken the, uh, the support, the pillars of support of the of the regime. Uh, what's interesting about uh, what happened in, uh, in in Palestine, the first Intifada. Was that uh, you know though the iconic images are the kids mm -hmm. throwing stones? The fact that they consciously decide not to use lethal force mm -hmm. uh, was was uh, was critical, as well as the fact that what really um, shook up things with the Israelis were the more classical nonviolent aspects, right. the the legal protests, the the the, the boycotts, the strikes, um, that uh, economic you know, and yeah, social. yeah 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 with the uh, the the um, the construction industry, the restaurant industry, other you know, service industries depend on Palestinian labor, apparently right. shut down uh, for a period of time. Uh, the fact that they 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 really they push for the the, the creation of these alternative uh, of uh, committees, you know, for um, you know um, education, healthcare. Uh, people started gardening again, uh, right. growing food, their own foods. They wouldn't be dependent on on Israeli food. Women started sewing clothes again, so they wouldn't you know be dependent on on, on the Israelis. They they they, they in many ways. Uh, were forming the basis of a new Palestinian society, and not only did it challenge the Israeli occup occupation, but also the old feudalistic, patriarchal, pro-Jordanian so elite. Social. So, so there's in many ways it was almost as much a social revolution as right. a struggle for um, uh, for independence. Um, one survey of the uh, uh, the uh, directives by the um, resistance committees showed that 92% uh, were explicitly nonviolent. Right, uh, and and this is what scared the Israelis. I mean, you could get five years in prison for belonging to one of these committees. Right. Uh, and it's interesting, they almost immediately expelled Mubarak Awad, 
who was a uh, Palestinian who founded the uh, Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence, mm -hmm. was call, cause, calling for nonviolent uh, resistance. They expelled, arrested and expelled him almost immediately, uh, whereas they allowed Sheikh Yassin, you know, founder of right. Hamas, uh, to, uh, to go free for a full year before they... Uh, uh, they, they finally uh, they found fi him with weapons. Fi they finally held, finally held him, uh, and in many ways, because I think, because, frankly, the Israelis are more comfortable dealing with violent right. resistance. They had no idea how to um, how to resist this, and um, the um, and and though uh, in, in certain ways the uh, Palestinian struggle seems as um, you know far removed from uh, ending the occupation as ever. The, the fact that uh, that this did really get things moving in terms of uh, Jordan formally renouncing their claim to the West Bank, mm -hmm. uh, getting the PLO in Israel to you know, sit down for negotiations, um, uh, the recognition of Palestinian nationhood, if not yet mm -hmm. uh, statehood, statehood. Um, that, that it really did move things forward in the ways that um, armed struggle uh, was never able to do.